Uh, Zechariah 8. We're going to cover all 23 verses this morning. We've been walking through this book since February. So we find ourselves in chapter 8, which is part of really one big long discourse. One, we could say sermon that started in chapter 7. Pastor Tyler did a great job of faithfully delivering God's word from chapter seven to us last week. So my task is these 23 verses in chapter eight. Let's, let's do this. Let's read the text. Let's pray and then we'll get into it. So bear with me. It's about two and a half, three minutes worth of reading. We can do this because this is God's word, right? So hear the word of the Lord to you this morning. And the word of the Lord of hosts came saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I am jealous for her with great wrath. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of great age. And the streets shall, of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of this people of those days, should it also be marvelous in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. Thus says the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong. You who in these days have been hearing these words from the mouth of the prophets who were present on the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. For before those days, there was no wage for man or any wage for beast. Neither was there any safety from the foe for him who went out or came in. For I set every man against his neighbor. But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people in the former days, declares the Lord of hosts. For there shall be a sowing of peace. The vine shall give its fruit. The ground shall give its produce. And the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. And as you've been a byword of cursing among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus says the Lord of hosts, as I purpose to bring disaster to you when your fathers provoked me to wrath and I did not relent, says the Lord of hosts. So again, I have purposed in these days to bring good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear not. These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. And love no false oath. For all these things I hate, declares the Lord. And the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, the fast of the tenth, and shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feast. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. Thus says the Lord of hosts, peoples shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities, the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. You have not left us in darkness, but you have revealed yourself to us in a way by which we can know you and your saving grace through the work of your son, Jesus. So Lord, I pray that you would uh, remove any blinders that we may have this morning. You would speak to our hearts. You would save us, those of us in this room who, who do not know you or those who may not know you. I pray that you would save and I pray that you would sanctify your people. You would build us up in the truth of the gospel this morning. You would get me out of the way and you would be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. Well, uh, let me say this before we get into our text this morning. Great stories have great reversals. Uh, think about every good story or a good movie. There's usually a twist, a reversal that occurs. But some of the most compelling stories uh, that, that really exemplify this idea of reversals are stories of adoption. Many of you got to witness uh, the adoption of two young children into the Skewmaker home. We just 
commissioned James to be one of our deacons here. Uh, they just adopted two young children this week. Many of you have been adopted or you have adopted children. But consider this for a moment. Consider the reversal of adoption. Uh, an abandoned child with no hope, no bright future ahead of them, no family to share life with, no inheritance to their name is suddenly and in their minds really unexpectedly embraced by two loving parents who choose to make that child their own. They welcome them into their home and into their family. A, a loving relationship it becomes a reality and everything about that child's life is then reversed. It is radically transformed. Think about it. That child now has a hope that they certainly didn't have before. A future they could have never imagined. An inheritance to their name that they didn't even know existed. Reversed. Reversed because there has been this relationship that has restored them. What makes adoption stories so emblematic of this text, Zechariah 8, is this. That reversal that occurs, occurs because a parent chooses to adopt the child. The relationship leads to the reversal. If you're a Christian, the Bible is clear. We have been adopted into a family. In fact, for our call to worship, I don't know if you caught that, but we read from Ephesians 1. And in Ephesians 1, Paul's clear. We've been predestined in love for adoption as sons of our Heavenly Father. We've been adopted into a family. And because of that, there has been a reversal that's true for us. If you're taking notes, we can take these 23 verses and really summarize the main point is this. When God faithfully restores His people, He will graciously reverse their condition. When God restores His people, He will reverse their condition. Or we could say it like this. When God restores, He reverses. I'm going to show you that from the text this morning. So I said earlier that chapter 8 is really, really the, the latter half to this one sermon that Zacharias is, is preaching. Pastor Tyler walked us through faithfully and very convictingly chapter 7. Remember how that chapter began. It began in the fourth year of King Darius the fourth day of the ninth month. This is 518 B.C., December 7th, 518 B.C. to be exact. We get a, an exact date marker here. That date's significant because this is two years after the, the visions of Zechariah, the night visions that we walked through uh, at the beginning of the book. And this is two years prior uh, to the day that the, the, the temple will be restored. It will be finally complete. Two years prior to, to, to when the, the temple will finally be rebuilt. And remember, that the, the chapter began with a question in verse 7. I'm sorry, in verse 3. Uh, there were delegates from Bethel sent to the priest in Jerusalem to ask a question. What was the question? Should I weep and abstain in the fifth month as I've done for so many years? In other words, now that the work of the temple has reconvened, should we continue to do these fasts? And God really question their motives. Why are you doing what you're doing anyways? Are you doing this to get something out of it? Are you trying to bend my arm? Or are you doing it because you're truly remorseful over your sin, because you're truly hungering for my presence? What is it? And we were challenged last week about our duty and our devotion. And then uh, we read at the end, uh, God, God bringing up the, the past. What did he do to the generation prior to these people? Because some of you are new, I realize that, and you're coming in midway through a book, um, so you're not quite sure what's going on. But, but God is dealing with the people who have been exiled from Jerusalem because of their sin and idolatry and rebellion. They've spent 70 years away from Jerusalem, and then he lovingly and graciously brings them back through the decree of Cyrus, a Persian king, and they're back in their homeland, but, but they're not even a nation anymore. They're uh, an insignificant province. 40 to 50,000 people, not a mighty nation as they once were under Solomon and David. Insignificant. And God brings them back to the wreckage and ruins and they begin to rebuild the temple. Uh, there's a time where they stop, 16 years, and then God raises up Haggai and Zechariah to, to encourage them, to, to get them really back to work. And we get to this section. God's saying, don't you remember what I did in the past when they weren't truly devoted to me, yeah, they kept the fast and, and, and they kept the festivals and outwardly they, they did what they should have done, but their hearts weren't with me. And what did I do? Well, 
We're told he didn't listen to their prayers. He scattered them and he left the land desolate. But here we see with this remnant, this group, they're not going to get the word of judgment as their ancestors did. They're going to get God's word of mercy and grace. He will, in fact, restore the city and he will reverse their condition. So here's the outline for us this morning. As we're thinking through this text, through the lens of the cross, right? I've told you, when we approach the Old Testament, we have to read it as Jesus told us to read it. How did he tell us to read it? If we miss him, we've missed it. All of the Old Testament testifies and points to the work of Jesus. So we're going to put our gospel glasses on and we're going to read this in light of of the cross. So there are four reversals that are really ours if we're a Christian. Four reversals that accompany a relationship uh, that God has restored. And and I'm going to argue they're, they're ours as God's people, his new covenant people, the church. However, there is a reality to these that we won't fully experience until Christ returns. So they're already already ours, but, but not yet fully realized. You with me? We'll see those as we walk through them. The first, we've gone from scattered to saved. I'm getting this from the first eight verses here. Notice the word of the Lord of hosts comes and he says, I'm jealous for Zion in verse two with great jealousy and I'm also jealous with great wrath. We've seen God's jealousy pop up in this book before, way back in chapter one. The very first vision, God tells Israel of his jealousy. This is not a a flippant sinful jealousy as we often get jealous coveting something that we don't have. That's wrong jealousy. God's jealousy is righteous, good jealousy. I have likened it before to the jealousy a husband should have towards his spouse or a wife should have towards his husband. That's a good, right jealousy. God is jealous for the affections of his people because when those are misplaced, that's idolatry and and bad's going to happen. And it's a good thing for God to be jealous for the affections of his people. So he's jealous for our affections and he's jealous so much so that he will restore what our sins ruined. We've seen that throughout the book of Zechariah. And notice in the next few verses, he's going to take this city that was once ravaged and he's gonna do a complete restoration process project with it. He says in the very next verse, I've returned to Zion. Now notice those words are in the past tense. In fact, if you do some word study, those are in the perfect tense. It's as if this has already happened, but you should be kind of scratching your head thinking, but wait, the temple isn't yet built. They're working on that. Two years, they got two years left, but God is teaching us that he is not bound to a physical building. Isn't this what he told um, Solomon way back in the book of first Kings? Hey, you're going to build this temple for me, but I need you to know that I'm not bound by, by a temple made with human hands. God has always been present with his people. Even when they were in exile, he was present with his people. How do I know that? Because he has been raising up prophets to speak his word to his people. He has not left them or abandoned them. And here we see God saying, I've already come back. But notice what he says next. I will dwell in Jerusalem, in the midst of Jerusalem. And the city shall be called the faithful city, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. I will dwell. So in one sense, I think God's referring to the temple here. When the temple is rebuilt, people are going to see it with their eyes. And everything about this city is going to change. The identity of the city is going to change. It will be the faithful city. Why did God use that language? Well, if you think about Israel for the past several hundred years, in the context of Zechariah, they've not been very faithful. That, that's what landed them in, idol- in, in, uh, in exile. Their idolatry, their immorality, their injustice. And God says, that's going to completely change. And I'm going to prosper this city. They're going to be the faithful city. By the way, the, the phrase, the mountain of the Lord, is really an Old Testament phrase for God's dwelling. We see that throughout the Psalms. God's saying, I'm going to come back and restore the city. But notice, something else is going to happen. God's going to repopulate this city. Old men, verse 4, and old women are going to sit in the streets with their staff in hand because of great age, but not just old men and old women, but little infants, children. Boys and girls are going to be in the streets playing. Now, now we we have to stop and think. That doesn't seem like a big deal in our day and age. 
In fact, later this afternoon, I'm going to probably go sit on my porch and watch my son play in the front yard. And I'm going to really uh, experience some, some joy in that moment. I hope you guys uh, uh, feel joy when you get to see your child playing outside. That's a, a joyful um, feeling. But think about the context of, of where we're at. This would have seemed like impossible. The land was ravaged and ruined. Only 40,000 to 50,000 Jews came back and it wasn't, it wasn't protected from the outside. This was not a city where you wanted your kids to just go play in the streets. There wasn't a wall there to protect them. Anybody could come in and attack them. It had been attacked. So, so in their mind, they're thinking, this is a silly promise, God. Not only that, but where are all these people gonna come from? Where are they coming from? There's only 40 to 50,000 that came back. Remember, most of the Jews stayed behind in Babylon, right? Most stay behind. Where are they coming from? Now, I'm not going to preach this necessarily linearly, and that's going to make some of you uptight. I don't typically do that. But every now and then we, we preach the text a little more thematically because that's kind of what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm going to come back to verse 6. I'm not going to skip any verse but I am going to jump around a little bit, okay? Just, I'm giving you a, a, a warning. Skip verse six. Go to verse seven. Here's where the people will come from. I will save my people from the east and the west country. I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They will, shall be my people and I will be their God in faithfulness and righteousness. The words from the east country and the west country if you, if you peel back the original language, the Hebrew, that's actually from the setting of the sun to the rising of the sun, it's two polar opposites. This is what's called a merism. Uh, you, you express this to, to, to express comprehensiveness. We, we, we use this a lot when we're saying, you know, I lost my keys. Have you looked for your keys, hon? Have you done that? Yeah, I've searched high and low. Two opposites. To say I've searched everywhere. God is saying I'm going to bring a people, not just Jews, but also Gentiles. We're going to see that in a little bit. Who have been scattered throughout the whole world, and I'm going to bring them back to dwell safely in this city. Now, why is God going to do that? Is it because this generation is somehow better than the generation before them? Is it because they're uh, um, more worthy of, of God's presence in their life? If that, is that what it is? No. I don't want you to miss this. Underline these words in verse 8. In faithfulness and in righteousness, God's going to do it because he's faithful. Because God doesn't lie. Because if God makes a promise, and he's always promised that he will preserve a people, in spite of those people, he's always going to come through. You need to know this, church. God always comes through with his promises. You can bank on it. He's not a man. He's not like me. If you're honest, you've broken plenty of promises in your life. I've broken plenty of promises. God has not. 100% track record, never broken a promise. And he's going to do this, not because of the goodness of this remnant. We've seen they're wrestling with the same sins that their ancestors wrestled with. He's going to do it because of his faithfulness and his mercy and his grace. And this should, should really shock the audience. In fact, it did. Notice verse 6. Now go back. Look at, look at what he says. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if this is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of this people, should it be marvelous in my sight? What are you saying? If this seems incomprehensible to you, are you going to limit me to thinking like you? I am God. I can do this. Now, I want us to do two things right here. I want us to, number one, ask, when was this fulfilled? Would these people, this group of remnant, ever see this type of city where the streets were filled with old men and old women in their old age watching their grandchildren ride their bikes through the streets of Jerusalem? Well, to one degree, this prosperous city would happen. I mean, Jerusalem would be a city that would, would be, in fact, rebuilt. We're, you know, you follow the storyline of the Old Testament. Nehemiah is going to come later and rebuild the walls of the city. The, the temple is going to be rebuilt in just a few years. People are going to come back to the city. The population over time is going to increase. I mean, today there's a, about a million plus people that live in Jerusalem in and around the city, young and old. 
But I mean, if you followed the news lately, you know it's not the safe and prosperous city that we're reading about here. This is fulfilled in the church. This, you guys remember uh, the, the, I think it was the third vision. Yeah, it was the third vision. The city with no walls. The measuring line, the man with the measuring line comes out to measure the city. And, and, and the angel says, stop, you're not going to measure the city that way. That's, that's according to, to your standards and your measurements. God doesn't, he doesn't operate that way. You can't comprehend the city he's building. It's not going to need a wall. There's going to be a people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, a multitude that, that fill this city. I, I think this is pointing to the church that this is us from scattered to say, I mean, we are reading these words uh, some 2,000 plus years later, some 2,000 miles away from Jerusalem, right? We've gone from scattered to save. But notice again, verse six, God is correcting unbelief. It's as if these people had limited God to think like them. How can, the, how can this be, God? How can this be? I mean, I mean, think about, we, we don't have a wall up. We're vulnerable to the attacks of, of, of our enemies. We're a despised people. Hence the phrase, the, the Lord of the host, or the Lord of hosts repeated throughout this text. Did you know we see the words, the Lord of hosts 23 times in 17 verses, if you counted? The phrase, thus says the Lord of hosts 10 times. Why? Because God is saying, do you know who's promising you these things? Not a man. The sovereign God of all creation, the Lord of hosts is saying this. He's combating unbelief, really. John Calvin, in his commentary on, uh, on this text, wrote this. It'll be on the screen. Just think about this for a moment. It was very convicting when I read it. He said, we see now the true source of unbelief and also faith. Notice what the source of unbelief is, because let's just be honest. If we were in their shoes, we would have said the same thing. This is too marvelous for you. This is too amazing to comprehend. I don't even know if you can do this, God. The true source of unbelief is this. When men can find God's power to their own understanding, when we make God out to be like one of us, that's unbelief. God, you can't act that way because I wouldn't have done it that way. Because my circumstances tell me this is how you have to act. When we make God out to, to be like us, an inch taller than us, that's unbelief. However, look at, look at what he says next. The source of faith is this. When they ascribe to God the praise due to his infinite power, when they regard not what is easy, but being satisfied with his word alone, they are fully persuaded that God is true and that what he promises is certain because he is able to fulfill it. You know, I don't know if you knew this, but there's an offense to God when we measure God's ability to act based on our finite fallen understanding. Really, I think there's, a, there's an application here that all of these promises are gonna be future promises for these people. The application is, do you believe God's word even, even if it sounds too crazy for you to comprehend? Like, really? You're building this city right now? You're going to bring in a people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation? And by the way, we will experience this prosperity one day with our eyes. When Jesus returns and that new Jerusalem comes, we're going to see it with our eyes. The question is, are you going to believe it? There's a second reversal. So, so we've gone from scattered to saved. We've got to keep going. We've gone from pitiful to prosperous. Where did I get that? Well, let me show you. Go to verse 9. He says, let your hands be strong. You who in these days have been hearing these words from the mouth of the prophets who were present on the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid that the temple might be built. That was a mouthful. What is he saying? Number one, he's saying, keep building. Even those of you who were around when Cyrus issued the decree some 18, years, 18 to 20 years prior, you came back, you started working, and you stopped because of all the opposition. Do you remember that? And before that, how, how bad your circumstances were? Keep building. Now, I do want us to see something here. Remember, the temple will not be complete for another two years. And all of these promises of reversal, which are Future. These are future promises. These are promises of what God will do. They were not meant to cause passivity to those people that heard them. What, what does he mean, let your hands be strong? Keep laying the brick on top of the brick and building the temple. 
It was meant not to cause passivity, but to spur them to act. And the same is true for us today. All of the promises of God that he gives us in his word are not to lead us to passivity. What do I mean? We see clearly in scripture that we serve a God that is sovereign. He is working out his plan. And that's a good thing. We know all things, even sinful things, God in a mysterious way that we'll never comprehend. You'll never figure this out. Don't ask me because I'm human too and I'm not going to figure it out either. Takes those and he works them out for his glory and our good. That's clear. How do I know that? Well, look at the cross. Look at the cross. So everything else, I know that he does that with, for his people. He takes it and he, he sovereignly in a mysterious way reverses those things and makes those turn out for his glory and our good. Does that lead us to sit back and say, well, Jesus, you've given us a promise that you're going to build your church. The gates of hell will not prevail. You're going to do it, so I'm just going to sit back and just watch other people do the work. No. Let your hands be strong. That should spur us on, just, just as this promise would have spurred these people on, should spur us on to build the church, build the temple, the church. It should spur us on to mission, generosity, service. It should spur us to our knees in prayer. So he gives a plea. Don't quit. He then gives a promise. Look at verse 10. For before those days, there was no wage for man or any wage for beast. Neither was there any safety from the foe for him who went out or came in. I said, every man against his neighbor. Do you remember how pitiful your situation was? At least the situation of the, the generation prior to you. When they first came back, you were fair game. You know, God promised to give them a land they disobeyed him and he took it away. And then he gives, he says, go back. But when they go back, it's a desolate land. It's a desolate land. They were exploited. They had to labor hard for little wage. We see this in the book of Haggai. They were attacked. They were vulnerable. God says, don't you remember that? But look at what he says. I'm not going to treat this generation in that way. That's what he says in verse 11. And then he, then he gives the specific promise in verse 12. For there shall be sowing, a sowing of peace. The vine shall give its fruit. The ground shall give its produce. The heavens shall give their due. And I will cause this remnant to possess all of these things. This is covenant language. Your homework is to go read Deuteronomy 28. And in Deuteronomy 28, which happened thousands of years prior to this, God, you know, he has rescued his people from uh, slavery in Egypt. He brings them out. He, they wander in the wilderness and then he brings them into the promised land. And right before they do, he gives this commissioning from Moses. And these are some of Moses' last words in, in Deuteronomy. He gives them the blessing and the curses of the covenant. What, what, what does that mean? Well, God has rescued them and saved them. And then he gives the law. He doesn't give the law prior to him saving them. That's important for us to understand. Obedience doesn't save us. Grace saves us. Obedience is a response to grace. And then he says, look, you need to live in alignment with my law. If you do, there will be blessing because God's law leads to life. This is how we were, we were made to live. And when we get that out of whack, there's gonna be curses. And we see this play out in the Old Testament. There's curses when, when they're out of, out of alignment with, with God and his law, when they, when they fall into idolatry or immorality. We, we see God bringing the curses of the covenant upon the land. If they failed to obey, the, the land would be cursed. Crops were destroyed. Rain was held back. There was no harvest, no fruit. Their livelihood was in jeopardy because of God's righteous judgment. But God's saying, look, because of my faithfulness, go back to verse eight, not because of the goodness of the remnant, because of the faithfulness of God, that's not gonna be the case for this group. They're gonna get the blessings of the covenant. They're gonna be prospered. And I don't, I'm not talking about monetary prosperity here. I said these are ours in the gospel. I'm talking about the blessings of salvation that are far better than, than a certain number of, of, of zeros in our bank account. This is the bless, This is covenant language. Look, we next see God's good, sovereign purpose. I'm gonna skip 13. I told you I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Verse 14 says, as I've purposed to bring disaster to you when your fathers provoked me to wrath and I didn't relent, so again I've purposed in these days not to bring disaster, but the complete opposite I have purposed to bring good to Jerusalem and to Judah. And underline this. We see this several times throughout. Fear not. Notice all of these promises are accompanied with some type of application. 
The application in verse 6. I'm going to do this. Are you going to believe me? <laughs> the application earlier. Let your hands be strong. I'm, I'm promising this. Keep working. And here's another application. What is it? Underline it. Because we're going to go back to verse 13. It's there too. Fear not. Why would he need to tell them not to fear? Remember, they were vulnerable. The, the walls of the city were not up. They had plenty of opposition. Their byword in the, in the mouth of the nations just as we are too, as God's people, the church. He says, fear not. Don't. My promises should combat your fear. So how do we fear not? Well, we do exactly what God's telling these, uh, this group of remnant to do. Believe me, trust me. That's how we fear not. You, you've gone from pitiful to prosperous. Turn to Romans 8. Turn to Romans 8. The end of Romans 8. This came to me as I was sermon prepping this week. You know, oftentimes we fear, and I know that's a very generic word. I mean, why do we fear? We fear losing our job. We, fear, we might fear losing our life, losing our health. We fear loss. But we fear loss because we forget what we have. That's oftentimes when we fear that. We're walking with our eyes. We're not walking by faith. But Paul knows that, and God knows that. So God gives Paul these words, the end of the, arguably one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bible. He says this, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, verse 36, as it's written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Look, verse 37, no. In all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, I am 100% confident that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth. And Paul said, just in case, you know, I, I forgot something here in this long list of things that, that you think could separate you. Nothing in all of creation is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ our Lord. Yes, what great promises that we have now on the other side of the cross that there is nothing that can separate us from the covenant love of God in Christ. Nothing. Nothing. So even your worst fear, maybe it's death. That's on that list, isn't it? That can't separate you if you're a Christian, if you've really trusted in Jesus by faith from the love of God that is in Christ. We've gone from pitiful to prosperous. I'm going to circle back to that at the end, so I want you to hold that thought. But, but here we see that should give us reasons to not fear to fear not. There's a third, a third reversal. Go back to Zechariah. We've gone from fasting to feasting. I'm going to skip verses 16 and 17. I'm coming back. Verses 18 and 19. The word of the Lord of hosts comes again. Verse 19, thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. Now, Pastor Tyler did a great job of connecting all of these fasts to certain dates on the calendar. I'm not going to go re-preach his sermon. But remember how this great sermon began. If we say it began in chapter 7, which I believe it did, it began with a question. The question was about fasting. It's the fifth month. Should we continue to fast now that the temple uh, work has been reconvened? And those other months, all of them correlate on the, the exile's calendar to a date that was that was significant when it came to the destruction of the city and the destruction of the temple. So they would fast to remember that and to mourn. But here God says there's going to be a day where you don't have to fast, where it, your fast will turn into what? Feast. Now, what is he talking about? I told you that these are ours as the church. These are actually a reality for us. They're already ours. But we've not yet fully experienced them. What do I mean? Well, go to, go to Matthew 9. You can also go to Mark 2, but I'm going to take you to Matthew 9. You can mark, add Mark 2 to your homework as well. Matthew 9. You guys might have heard this story. Jesus gets asked a question about fasting. The disciples of John come to Jesus. I'm in verse 14. And they ask him, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? We're noticing something's different about your disciples. They're not doing that fast thing. Why aren't they doing that fast thing? And Jesus said to them, can the, bride, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? 
And then he says, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away and then they will fast. And he's implying, but right now they don't need to fast. Why? Who is Jesus? John 6, Jesus makes this incredible statement, one of his I am statements to tell us who he really is. He is the bread of life. We talked last week, why do we fast? Well, number one, we fast to mourn over our sin. But we also fast to express our dependence on someone beyond us. And then we also fast because every time you fast, you should start to feel some hunger, right? You should start to feel your, your, your stomach rumble and ache. And it reminds us of a layer underneath our stomach that food alone cannot satisfy. Only one person can satisfy. And it is Jesus. Only Jesus. For every aching human heart, there's only one bread that can satisfy and nourish that. And it is Jesus alone. And he says, I am the bread of life. And he, and he says that in John 6, only I can satisfy. So, so in a sense, we keep the gospel in mind. We know that there's going to come a day when Jesus returns and we don't need to fast anymore. And while he was on this earth with, walking with his disciples, they didn't need to fast because the groom was with them. The bread of life was walking amongst them. Why did they need to fast? They needed to celebrate that the God of creation, the Savior of the world was walking with them, but he would be taken away. We know that. He would die, he would rise again, he would ascend to the right hand. So we're in that already but not yet phase. There is, there is a longing we have when we fast, right? Our fasting is in light of the fact that Jesus has already come. He has been broken for sinners. This is why we partake in the Lord's Supper. But there is going to be a day that we feast with him. This is looking forward to that day. That day in Revelation, when we're sitting around at a big, massive supper table, if you're in Christ, and there is a number that you can't even comprehend. The Bible says a number so large, no, we can't count. More than the sand on the, on, the, on the ocean's shores. We can't count that. A people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, people that look different than you, people that, that speak differently than you, we're gonna be sitting around at this massive supper table feasting with Jesus and we will never fast again. That's what this is promising. And this was to bring cheer and joy in the hearts of the hearers. This is why I said, because of that right now, you love truth and you love peace. So we have gone from feasting, I'm sorry, from fasting to feasting. There's one more promise and we gotta, we gotta move quickly. There's one more promise. We've gone from a byword to a blessing. That's the fourth reversal. A byword to a blessing. I skipped verse 13, so let me go back to it. And the nations, I'm sorry, and as you have been a byword of cursing among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, I will save you and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, let your hands be strong. Not just Judah, but also Israel here, the northern kingdom, the Jews. They're going to be a blessing to the nations, but right now they're a byword. How are they gonna be a, a blessing? Skip down to verse 20. There's a little more clarity given at the end here. Thus says the Lord of hosts, people shall come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord, to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem to entreat the favor of the Lord. And you have to remember, at this point in history, the Jews were a byword in the mouth of every other nation. They are a meager 40 to 50,000 people coming back to this province. They're not even a nation. They're part of Persia. In fact, they're never gonna be a nation again. Never, never gonna be a nation the, the way they were before. When did, when did this happen? You see, I think Zechariah was prophesying of the day when God promised Abraham way back at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 12. You guys remember when God called Abraham, called him to be the father of his people. He said, in you all nations will be blessed. As the Old Testament progresses, we get a little more clarity on that. And Zechariah is, is pointing us to the day when this would happen. But it wouldn't happen with these people physically seeing it with their eyes. Listen to this, one author wrote this, when this prediction was uttered, nothing seemed more hopelessly improbable than its fulfillment. 
The Jews were a poor, despised, obscure tribe in the heart of Syria whose existence was only known to the mighty world by their furnishing a trophy to the victorious arms of Babylon. Greece was, not, was just rising in the firmament of human history. Rome was then in the rugged feebleness of her wolf-nursed infancy and slowly continued to grow until she ruled the earth. 500 years rolled away, and this prophecy remained unfulfilled. Indeed, it seemed further from fulfillment than when it was uttered. When would this come? You see, it would come some 500 to 600 years later after our Lord lived a perfect life. He died the death in the place of sinners. He was rose. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He promised that he would leave his ragtag group of disciples a helper. He said, don't worry, I'm leaving you a helper. And we read the book of Acts and what happened? In Acts 2, these men are praying all in an upper room and we're told it's not just those disciples, but there are men from all over the nations. And they hear the gospel being proclaimed in their own tongue, the mighty acts of God in a language they can understand. And in that moment, a wildfire happened. That, that good news of the gospel started to spread to all the nations. This happened in the church. And it's still happening Again, that's why we're hearing the good news some 2,000 plus years later, some 2,000 miles away from Jerusalem because God's not building a city confined by walls. Even the ocean can't confine God's city. We're on the other side of the globe and he's still building this city. A byword to a blessing. How, did this, how does this happen? We'll go down to verse 23, a very important verse as we as we get to the end of chapter eight, look, look, look at what this verse says. Thus the, the, says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men, a multitude, 10 being significant of a multitude, symbolic of a multitude, from the nations of every tongue shall take the hold of the robe of a Jew. Note that doesn't say the Jews, that says a Jew, that's very important, saying, let us go with you, for we've heard that God is with you. I'm arguing that God has chosen to bless the nations through his church. That's what we see here. People seeing this city and saying, I want to go there. Let, let's run there. Let's flee there. People grabbing the hold of God's people saying, we know that God is with you. Well, what am I saying? Listen, church, non-believers will not flee to Jesus because we hold up signs on street corners proclaiming God's judgment. And I'm not bashing street evangelism, but that's not going to do it. And I'm not bashing preaching or I wouldn't be up here preaching to you this morning. He, he's not going to build his church because you hide behind the screen of your phone. You, you, hit, you hit send or, or post on Facebook uh, and you air your theological prowess and your words of judgment to those that don't know Jesus. That's not the way he's going to do it. He's going to do it as the church starts to display, not just declare. We have to declare the gospel. You guys know, I say this all the time. The gospel is good news. It has to be told. How will they know if, if we don't tell them? But the world needs to see that our lives also display the gospel too. The church will be built as we start looking more and more like Jesus. As we start living a way that is distinct from the world. So the world looks at us and says, you're different and I want what you have. God is with you. I want in on that. And we say, you, if I can get in on this, you can get in on this. Right? If God saved me, he can certainly save you. So, so what I'm saying is this. The nations will flock to Jesus when we get serious about displaying Jesus and how we live. Yet, yeah, declare the gospel, but display it as well. If your lips and your lives aren't in alignment, the world's just going to look at you and say, you're just like everyone else. You're just like everyone else. So we have to be serious about living distinctly in a broken world. We have to be serious about actually being a light in our workplace and in our family, about actually being salt in our school. We actually have to start thinking about the patterns and rhythms of our life and say, my neighbor's watching me. Am I living differently than my, than my non-believing neighbor? To, am I making Jesus attractive? Because Jesus did say this. He said, the world's gonna know you're my disciples, not because of the amount of theological knowledge you can spit off, and I'm not saying anything's wrong with that, because you have me of all people, I, I love theology. But Jesus said, the world's going to know you're my disciples by how you what? Love one another because your life's going to look radically different than the world. Radically different. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the great preachers 
of the last century said this. He said, what the church needs to do is not organize evangelistic campaigns to attract outside people, but to begin herself to live the Christian life. If she did that, men and women would be crowding into our buildings and they would be saying, what's the secret of this? Think about that. If you're a Christian, right now in the eyes of the world, we are, like I told you, there's an already not yet reality to this. We're a byword. We're crazy for believing in what we believe, but we know this is true. This is the way to salvation. And God has chosen to bring in people from every tribe, tongue, and nation through his church. So in a sense, we're a blessing. Are you living that? Four reversals. I showed you them from the text. Four reversals. What's the first? We've gone from scattered to saved. The second, we've gone from pitiful to prosperous. We've gone from fasting to feasting. And we've gone from a byword to a blessing. But I want you to see that these reversals are only a result of restoration. When God restores, what does he do? He reverses. You don't get the reversals unless you get the restoration. The child doesn't get the inheritance unless they get the relationship with the father. They didn't even know the hair. That wasn't even on their mind. They They wanted the relationship. And God has chosen to restore his broken and fallen people because of a great reversal. And I don't want you to miss this. Look at verse 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts. We're going to go back to it. Ten men from the nations. That word in the Hebrew really means from the Gentiles, the, the, the nations that are not Jews. Of every tongue, they're going to take the hold of a robe of a Jew and say, God is with you. That's how God's going to save lost sinners. Through the robe of a Jew, through the Gentiles grabbing the robe of a Jew, a Jewish man named Jesus. The great reversal that took place for God to restore us is this, that Jesus one day was wearing a royal garment, a royal robe, a splendid crown, a majestic crown, seated at the right hand of the Father. And in love, he laid that down. He stepped all the way down into space and time. He clothed himself with flesh and there was a day he was clothed with another robe. In fact, there would be Gentiles leading up to Jesus' execution who would be grabbing Jesus' robe. In fact, they would pull that robe off of him. And you know what the reversal is? Jesus allowed them to do that. And they were grabbing the robe of Jesus not to honor him as we see here, But to do what? To mock him, to shame him. And what they did not realize is Jesus allowed them to do that so that he would take the shame that they deserve. If you're in Christ, that's that's what happened. And then what would those Gentiles go and do? They would divide Jesus' robe at the bottom of a cross as they continued their mockery of him. And they would take his hands and his feet and they would nail them to a wooden cross to hang him up so everyone could see Here's the king of the Jews. But what was Jesus doing that day? He was allowing himself to be killed, executed by those Gentiles so they would not be killed and executed by God's wrath, amen? And then what did Jesus do? The greatest reversal of all, Jesus died and went into a tomb that had their name on it. They thought they put Jesus in that tomb. The son of God said, I'll go to your tomb. And then on the third day after Satan, after death, had thought they had won the battle. We just sang about it. The very first song we sang, thought they won the war. What did Jesus do? In victory, he rose up. He crushed the head of the serpent and he spit death out of his mouth and he reversed it. The death that they deserved, Jesus took it in their place. The restoration happened because of a reversal. If you're in Christ, That's what God has done for you. I have two questions to close, two questions of application. I'm gonna go back to verses 16 and 17. The first is this, are you living in a restored way? Are you living in a restored way if, or in a reversed way? If if you're truly in Christ, your life should should, should start to look like that. Uh, A child adopted into a family eventually starts to take on the identity of the family over time. I I know our biological children do that, but, but even adopted children over time start to take on the habits, the rhythms, the routines, the traditions of the family. Look at verses 16 and 17. Coming back to what I skipped. These are the things you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true, that make for peace. 
Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another and love no false oath, but why? Look, for all these things I hate, declares the Lord. God hates those. Do you? If you've been adopted in, we should start looking like the father that adopted us in. We should start living in this reversed way. Do you hate those? Like, just scan your heart through this. Now, there's a reason these appear. Now, remember the scroll in the basket from a few visions ago? On one side of the scroll uh, was, was those who swear falsely, and on the other side uh, of the scroll uh, was, were, were those who steal. We see that pop up here again because clearly these were sins that this, this group of remnants struggled with. How can they quickly make a buck? I mean, their, their lives are kind of have been radically turned upside down. But let's be honest, as I said a few weeks ago, we do too. So scan your heart through this for a moment. I, I think we can just check, is there right now any unforgiveness in your heart? Is there any deceit? Are you living a, a lie to agree? Is there any unconfessed sin that maybe your spouse doesn't know about or a friend doesn't know about that you need to confess? Is there any bitterness towards someone else? If so, the Bible says God hates those things, and we should too. Are you living in a reversed way? And number two, are you living unaware or unamazed? Unaware. There's some of you in this room that you're not even aware you need to be restored. You're you're like the child in the orphanage prior to the adoption, not even thinking there's a father out there that wants to adopt you, thinking this is the best it's going to get. You're okay with that, okay with not having the inheritance. You're okay with not having the relationship. And the Bible says that's wrath written all over you. In fact, you're, 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 you're headed, you're destined for an eternal separation from the, from the grace of God because of your sin that you committed against a holy God. But listen, it doesn't have to be that way. God can restore you today. It doesn't matter what you've done or what you do. It only, only, the only thing that matters is what Jesus has done. And my commission to you, my challenge to you, to, 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 to grab hold of his robe. How do you do that? I'm talking about grab hold of his robe by faith. So on the cross, there was a great exchange that took place. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. He became the sin that I've committed The sin that I will commit because I've looked to him by faith and in return, I've grabbed a hold of his robe of righteousness and and I've gotten his record credited to me, his record of righteousness. That can be yours today simply by grabbing his robe, robe, trusting in him for salvation. If the band will come up, let's close. Are you unamazed by the reversal God has promised if you're in Christ? Just stop for a moment and think. This is yours. I told you that if you're in Christ, these promises are yours. Think about this. Your plight was pitiful. Ephesians 2 says we were were dead in our trespasses and sins, estranged, alienated from the Father, having no hope, no inheritance to our name. Death was our destination. Hell was our inheritance. And God in his love and his mercy snatched us from the flames of hell. He he raised us up, the Bible says, with his son Jesus. And not only that, it gets better. He seated us right beside Jesus. We're seated at the right hand of the Father. We're we're richer than we could ever comprehend with an inheritance uh, that we can't even fathom. Look at what God has done. He has rescued us. He has restored us. And he has reversed everything about us. Are you amazed this morning? I want you to just stop and think about these words. The band's gonna play a different song, but this song came to my mind and I wanna leave you with one of my famous, or my favorite, my favorite hymns. It's called I Stand Amazed. I hope you're amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned and unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be, and how marvelous, How wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the love that you've shown us in your son Jesus, the great reversal that's taken place. I thank you that you've restored us. Thank you that you've renewed us. May we be a people amazed by that. And may we live in light of that reality. In Jesus' name.